A moth had got caught in and floundered at the lamp chimney with great eyed wings, lay prostrate and quivering on the greasy oilcloth table cover. He crushed it with his fist and flicked it from sight and sat before the empty plate, drumming his fingers in the moth-shaped swatch of glinting dust it left. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today we're talking about Outer Dark by Cormac McCarthy. This is an early work of McCarthy's. Uh, I first came to him via The Road, which I actually picked up in a UK English section of a bookstore in Gothenburg, Sweden to read on my flights back home. Uh, however, due to a little bit of a delay and the enthralling nature of McCarthy's writing, I ended up reading it before the plane was even, the first flight was even airborne. And I, I was just completely captivated by this writer. Then I read what I still think is his magnum opus alongside Sutri, and that is Blood Meridian. I thought about doing Blood Meridian, but there's just been so much done on that already that I figured I'd talk about something that I still believe is a masterpiece of his, but doesn't get as much attention. And that would be this, his second novel, I believe, Outer Dark. It was written while he was actually abroad in Southern Europe, which is incredible to think that he was able to, just through the power of his imagination and memory, to channel and evoke the setting and atmosphere of Appalachia. So striking and detailed and multi-sensorial is his descriptive prose that you will believe yourself to be right there with the actions happening. Uh, there were times, for example, uh, when a character was spending the night in some stranger's house and the, uh, she had already gone to bed and then the, the family that lived there came in and started preparing for bed sort of in the same room. And I, the way that it is described by McCarthy, I felt myself holding my breath and staying very still while sitting there reading the book because I didn't want to draw any attention to myself just as the character there sleeping uh, from whose point of view we have, doesn't want to really draw attention to herself. And I almost felt like if I had accidentally sneezed or something like that, one of the characters being described would turn and look at me. That is seriously how vivid this prose is. Really, you have to read each page twice as you go through the book. Once to just savor the prose, and then twice to savor the prose again, but follow the story. The story is very succinctly drawn on the back cover. Uh, however, I am going to read it, but I'm going to leave out things that I think they should have left out. So if you haven't already read the synopsis that's on Amazon, Goodreads, uh, wherever on the back of the vintage paperback, just let this be all you know about it. Set in an unspecified place in Appalachia sometime around the turn of the century, a woman bears a child and her brother, leaves the baby in the woods and tells her he died of natural causes. Discovering her brother's lie, she sets forth alone to find her son. Both brother and sister wander separately through a countryside, being scourged by three terrifying and elusive strangers, headlong toward an eerie, apocalyptic resolution. That's perfectly uh, a description and all you need to know about the plot and everything that's going on. Right in the opening pages, a baby is born. We meet this brother and sister. We come to find out that they're called Kulla and Rinthi, and their last name is Holmes. They have a baby, and the brother goes and leaves it in the woods, it says that it died, and then we skip forward to find that the uh, brother and sister are separately trying to search out. On the side of the brother, He's sort of looking for his sister, but more looking for work than anything else. Uh, and he's certainly not looking for the child. The sister, uh, Renthi, she is on a search for her child, ultimately. Now, this works really well because one of the greatest things a fiction writer can do is to introduce two or more characters 
and have them go through a tremendous experience together and then separate them for a large portion of the text. Uh, every time that I've read fiction that uses this sort of device, I find that it is more enthralling uh, than other types of devices. And as the title, Outer Dark, implies, this is a very dark novel. It's menacing. It is bleak. It's very naturalistic in the literary meaning of naturalism, where uh, nature sort of overtakes any kind of human will or intent. Outer Darkness also has biblical connotations. It's mentioned three times in the book of Matthew, and it refers to people being cast out into outer darkness, where there's much weeping and despair and gnashing of teeth. And if you go back in the Old Testament, the Hebrew conception of darkness and wilderness and outer darkness, um, this is very much, you know, not necessarily Sheol or hell or what the Greeks would call Hades, but it's definitely a profane space. And because of this notion of an outer darkness, of course, there's also can be an inner darkness, but this notion of darkness being some, something that's out there, outside some kind of sanctum. I thought of Mircea Eliade's The Sacred and the Profane. This is a, a classic study of religion and myth and symbol um, and, and ritual. And one of the uh, main things that Eliade shows is that even for our modern, secular, or profane uh, person who decides to reject the tenets of religion or the notion of a supernatural uh, realm and being uh, and live in the profane or secular, uh, he shows how even for that person, there, are, uh, there is religious behavior and thinking that we can't quite rid ourselves of. This has been handed down from the original uh, sacred man, as it's called. Eliade says, to whatever degree he may have desacralized the world, the man who has made his choice in favor of a profane life never succeeds in completely doing away with religious behavior. And the bulk of the book is giving uh, observation and ultimately a summary of what that religious behavior, that lingering religious behavior exactly is. He says that a sign, so looking for some kind of sign, is asked to put an end to the tension and anxiety caused by relativity and disorientation. In short, to reveal an absolute point of support. And he shows and, and combs through many different religions and many different mythologies to show how there has always been this need for a, a centering and for, you know, for example, towns that formed uh, the church or some kind of inner sanctum was always at uh, inner sanctum was always at the middle, and in the same way we feel that we need to be the center of the universe, and this becomes uh, a sacred space, and that's one of the greatest uh, modes of thinking that we can apply to outer dark that Eliade gives us is the the notion of sacred space and profane space. So that outer darkness is the profane space. Now, if we apply it to the book, we open up with Rinthi and her brother Kala in their sacred space within this homestead. But what will happen for the entire remaining portion uh, of the novel is that they are thrust into one profane space after another, and they can never find any kind of centering or centralization or access point to claim as a sacred space. And so what they do is they look for it in a form of what Eliade would call signs. So Kala is constantly looking for it in, in work and getting uh, a job. And although this works out sometimes, it's very fleeting. It's constantly denied him. And in the same way, Rinthi is looking for her child as that sign and that centering space to start to, to push the outer darkness uh, into, you know, put greater margins around her sacred space and outer darkness. But again, this is constantly denied them. And that's what makes this work so harsh and so menacing. As Eliade has it, the center renders orientation possible. And so you'll note that with time, 
with uh, geographical area, memories of characters, you'll note that there is a disorientation at work. Nothing is absolute. Uh, and that's again because I believe uh, this is deliberate on uh, behalf of McCarthy, who is, uh, after all, a pro stylus and someone who uh, is very much in control of the craft. There are other biblical allusions in here, but they're usually twisted in some way. There's the biblical allusion to uh, Adam and Eve. We happen upon Kala and Renthi, and the, you know there are no parents. They're seemingly the only two people in the world. The birth of Moses and the story around that, and then the casting out of the demon into a herd of swine and them going over the hillside, uh, which is amazingly done by McCarthy. But again, none of them quite map isomorphically to the biblical stories. Atmosphere, atmosphere, atmosphere. McCarthy is at the top of his game here at the beginning, basically, of his career. This is some 20 years before Blood Meridian, even more before The Road. He repeats words in different variations, especially shadow, dark, violent. Even when he uses variations of these words, they're employed in really interesting and eye-catching ways, such as, half shrouded under old leaves glared back a small violence of color upon the bland March skies. It's incredible. He uses words that perfectly mirror the feeling of the overall story and characters such as quavering, scrabbled, moiled, and fence. Fence was a brand new word to me. McCarthy has introduced me to so many uh, small little words. He has such an incredible gift for vocabulary, especially when describing the setting. He says, a large two-story house fronted with wooden columns on which the paint lay open in long fence, like slashed paper and a yellow stain of road dust paling upward in the sunlight until the gable shone clean and white. But let's linger for just a second on that house fronted with wooden columns on which the paint lay open in long fence. We can see that. And fence, this is where I argue that the, the printed book continues to triumph even over the audiobook because some of these words that McCarthy chooses, they're not only pleasing to the ear and the inner voice, but to the eyes, the way they look in the sentence, the way they look uh, with the uh, apposite words around them. Fence is perfect for this. Fence kind of gives us this evocation of flake and vent, which is perfect for talking about how when paint dries because of uh, weathering and it opens up these little pockets. Fent means something like a shirt vent, like where your head pops through the neck, and you can just see those. The prose kind of goes back and forth between a severe minimalism and prose styling that wouldn't be minimalism, it wouldn't be maximalism either. Descriptivism, maybe, but it's done so well. And so the things that he chooses to get rid of are quotation marks, uh, even the continental M dash to set off dialogue. And he gets rid of chapter headings, even chapter numbers. He offers a masterclass in tension building. For example, there's a campfire scene and actually, now that I think about it, of all the McCarthy books I've read, uh, from Blood Meridian to All the Pretty Horses, Sutri, and The Road, and now Outer Dark, it seems that this is sort of a, a staple of his, and maybe even a, a, a Cormac McCarthy trope, right after Holmes's uh, disaster with a boat that he's trying to take across a river. Then there's this campfire scene, which should calm us down after that catastrophe, but it's actually even more intense uh, because of its slow burn and McCarthy's steady hand with pacing and tension building. Uh, and this happens over and over. What it ultimately is setting up for is the ghastly ending. It's amazing how with McCarthy, you can be in this harsh, cruel world but yet it can be rendered so beautifully and with such uh, luxurious prose. He came down out of the kept land and into a sunless wood where the road curved dark and cool, overlaid with immense ferns, trees hung with gray moss like hag's hair, and in this green and weeping fastness, bird calls, 
he had not heard before. He started off and she fell in behind and padded after him, shoeless and tattered, watching the cart lurch and weave and the tinware hung from the Travis poles swung in mounting discord like a demented symphony. What a simile. And then he often reinforces his imagery once or twice more. So in this case, after what I just read on the next page, we get, they went through the late afternoon curiously processional and grave among the banded shadows. The tinker stooped in the rotted leather with his cap far back on his head and eyes to the ground and her caught up in the wake of the cart and it's lonely tolling tinware like some creature wrapped and besourced by witch's music demon piping. She had begun to keen softly into her hands. The tinker could hear it a long way down the road. He could hear it far over the cold and smoking fields of autumn, his pans knelling, and that's like a death knell is how that's spelled, in the night like buoys on some dim and barren coast, and he could hear it fading and hear it die lost as the cry of seabirds in the vast and salt black solitudes they kept. So you see, it's sonically pleasing. It's visually pleasing. You want to read these passages out loud to yourself. Listen to this. This is incredible. What discordant vespers do the tinker's goods chime through the long twilight and over the brindled forest road, him stooped and hounded through the windy recrements of day like those old exiles who divorced of corporeality and enjoined ingress of heaven or hell wander forever the middle warrens sporeless increate and anathema hounded by grief by guilt or like this cheerless vendor clamored at heel through wood and fen by his own querulous and inconsolable wares in perennial tin malediction one of the reasons i wanted to go back and read a mccarthy book especially an earlier one and one I hadn't read, is because recently Rain Taxi assigned me a book by William Gay. This is being published posthumously, but William Gay had three uh, main inspirations. One was Cormac McCarthy, with whom he had some correspondence while they both lived at Tennessee in Tennessee at the same time. The other was William Faulkner, uh, which of course is a clear influence on McCarthy as well. And then the other was Mark Twain, so if you haven't yet, check out some of the fiction of William Gay. What this is, is a steak with perfect marbling. It's not too much fat, but it's that perfect amount of fat that lends all of the meat its flavor. But be careful, because as you chew on it, you may not really be fully aware of everything that you're taking in, in the same way that a character in this book chews on some very questionable meat which by the way is described in details I have never read in another book. If you haven't yet, give this early work of Cormac McCarthy, American master stylist, a chance.